Tokozani brings over 17 years of business leadership experience as a broadcasting executive and entrepreneur. Tokozani's track record in starting and successfully running enterprises in the television industry demonstrates the depth of his media sector knowledge and his, lead and his leadership as well as business acumen. So at this point in time, uh, as I'm handing over the platform to Mr. Nkosi, I just want to confirm, Mr. Nkosi, if you can hear me, is everything okay with your connection? Uh, hello there, Farah. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. That's perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so, so we're handing over the platform to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I'd like to greet you all in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it's wonderful what you guys are doing here. And I'd like to thank uh, Tafadzwa. I'd like to thank Farai and team for you know, having uh, allowed me to be part of you this morning. I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, we need men to hold each other accountable as iron sharpens iron. Um, you know, the, the kingdom of, of God will grow. I'd like, to, I've been invited here this morning to speak mainly about the role of media uh, in shaping our society today. Um, I doubt that I'll take up the entire hour. Um, my, my preference would be that perhaps towards, towards the latter part or, or the bottom of the hour, we could maybe engage more. But what I'll do is I'll just give um, an update. Probably will take about half an hour, so it could take a little bit longer. Um, and then beyond that, we can be able to uh, communicate. Perhaps in the meantime, should you have a comment or a question, you can put it up in the chat box so that we may then thereafter begin to uh, engage um, and give some clarity and ventilate some of these matters. Um, let me just uh, present my screen with the hope that you gentlemen are going to be able to see it. Farai, if you can uh, advise on your side as soon as you're able to see it. Yes, I can confirm that your screen is shared and we can see. Okay, great. Please do let me know if you can't see it. Okay, perfect. All right. Gentlemen, just to give you a little bit of, of a background on, on myself. Um, um, you know, from, from a very young age, I, 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 used, I just loved things that had to do with church. Um, even before my parents became Christian, I used to go with my neighbors and and uh and you know uh, my relatives and aunts and uncles to their different churches so and to that end i was able to go to all different types of churches from a young age i've always been attracted to to church um but i only really became a child of god i only be, uh, became saved at the age of 12 or so um but i had been going to church up up and since then but i had noticed you know at the time that i had a gift as a storyteller you know i would be i would be that child that would get the whole room um together and would be telling stories to them. My father had a dictaphone that journalists used to record people when they interview them. And I used to pretend that I was either a journalist or I was a, a storyteller and I'd, I'd play different characters on there. So it, 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 it showed at a young age that I had a, an interest in storytelling. And uh, when I became born again at the age of 12, I began to use that interest to write, you know, soul winning plays that we did as teenagers in our youth group at church that we performed to other youth groups in interdenominational youth fellowships. Um, and and uh, a lot of people noticed that there was a gift in me even at church. So I was encouraged to go and study this thing uh, formally and, and um, so that I can be able to, to learn more and learn the technical skills around it. Because as we know that you may have the talent, but without the skills, you know, there's not very little that you can do with your talent. So I then registered at VETS and I studied drama at VETS for four years um, at VETS Drama School, um, where, where I majored in television and, and, and writing. And uh, there after the opportunity I got, because even when I was at VETS, you know, uh, I did religious studies as, as, as one of the courses that I was doing. And um, in my doing those courses, got introduced to, you know, uh, uh, different people in different ministries. And I was able to um, uh, make connections with the production industry that was creating, you know, uh, had opportunities to create Christian programming. And uh, after Varsity 1999, I then joined a company to produce a, a show called Crux on SABC One, um, where I worked as a journalist, mainly speaking and telling stories of Christian triumphs against adversity and people that have stood the test of time as believers. So I was really trained uh, in the Christian television space 
uh, from that young age of around 22. Um, and, and this is a scripture that really kept me going at the time, you know, the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I use this scripture mainly for all the evangelical plays that I used to write um, as a teenager that we performed because we would use that for soul winning and, and you know, ahead of altar calls to be able to utilize the power of drama, the power of media, to be able to minister a particular idea, to propagate a particular idea. In that time, I learned, gentlemen, uh, even when I was studying as well, about the power of the media. And I saw the real, real power of the media there, that media influences society in many ways. It influences how we dress. It influences the music we listen to. It influences the languages that we speak, how we speak it, the accent we speak it in. It influences popular culture as a whole. The truth of the matter is that we are all products of media influence. I can tell you right now that the type of music that you like is influenced upon you. If you grew up in a different environment where they listen to hard rock or heavy metal, um, uh, uh, that is what music you would say you like uh, because that is the music that you would have been influenced to like. So what we see is what we become. What we consume is what we become. What, what we goes into our hearts, you know, whatever goes into our minds, it marinates in, in, in our minds. And from our minds, it descends to our hearts. And like the Bible says, that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So even our utterance is, a direct, um, is in direct proportion to what we hear and to what we see. And media accounts for the majority of what we hear and what we see, because media lives on our phones, which is where we spend most of our time. I'll go a bit deeper into that um, as we go along. Media is so powerful that in the 1800s um, in, in Britain, it was referred to as the fourth estate. Of course, we know about the three estates of government. Um, one in the olden times of um, uh, the, the French Revolution, you know, the clergy, the church was very, very important. In fact, the laws were set by the church. They were the, the one arm of, of, of the state. So they were the one of the three estates. Then the nobility, which was royalty at the time, of course, monarchies ran the world. Um, and the bishops, uh, who were the clergy, were the ones that were their advisors in terms of the governmental control of nations at the time. And they were the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, of their states. And the third of their states at the time, with the early introduction of democracy into the European system. Um, the commoners, and when they started to vote, now became even more important, which is what then led to the fourth estate, which was the media, because the commoners, in order for them to make a decision and vote for power, uh, for elected leadership into government, they had to be influenced and messages had to be propagated into their minds and heads to be able to uh, make a decision about who they vote for, which is why then the media became the fourth estate because of how important it was to shape the minds of the commoners in the decisions that they made about who rules them and who uh, ascends to power. So the current three estates now in modern times is of course the legislative, which is parliament and, and our, our legislatures, uh, depending on whatever system of government you have, whether you've got the House of, of, of Commons, um, or whether you've got you know, the, the, the British system, which we've adopted here mainly in, in South Africa and in, in, in Zimbabwe and other South African, uh, Southern African countries, where you've got you know, a parliament and you've got a legislature, and we've got the executive, we've got ministers um, uh, uh, who are the second arm of, 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 the, of the state, uh, you know, and then we've got the judiciary, of course, which is currently led in South Africa by uh, Judge Mokhoeng Mokhoeng, assisted by Judge Raymond Zondo. And of course, the media plays the fourth role in that, um, in, 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 in that quadrant and making it the four estates of, this, of, um, of running a government, in fact, of society as a whole. So it just shows how important it is as a part of society. And I just explained now um, just about where this thing comes from. And I'll just uh, maybe uh, read it again for maybe those that missed it if I was going a bit fast there. The term fourth estate has been used to refer to the press as a whole, really, 
uh, since at least the eighteen early hundred, the early eighteen hundreds, around eighteen thirty seven, the world, the word was actually the phrase was actually coined officially now as as the fourth estate, and it has become shorthand, you know, really to denote the public media as a pillar on which the smooth functioning of a democratic society rests. Now, together with the other three estates, which is the legislative, the um, executive, and the judiciary, you know, the media um, then really completes that quadrant. Now, in terms of the commoners, as I have mentioned earlier, um, you know, the media, because of the power of the ballot, has become that important. Now, in a democracy, the voice of the commoner, you know, the ordinary person is most important due to their power of that, you know, that one man and, and that one uh, vote system that we've got currently. Um, and for you to be able to shape each mind, because the one man, one vote system does not depend at all, you know, on a college, you know, an electrical, an electoral college system in America is different to what we've got here. We've got a one man, one vote. So the popular vote in Southern Africa is what really counts. So regardless of the level of power you have, that X on the ballot has got in as, as much power as the person who is in nobility. So the more numbers you have, the more you'll do better. So the control of the media is what those who are in power obviously want to have. Um, and the reason for that, gentlemen, is that we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So whatever perception that you've got of anything, uh, I'm not sure how many gentlemen are on this call, but whatever number of, of gentlemen are here in this call, we all each have a unique point of view about any subject that we can raise. In order then for us to be able to have a group think, as they call it, to be able to share a point of view, we need to propagate a message to one another. We need to meet on a Saturday morning at 7 a.m. to begin to propagate these ideas, to start to shape our thinking so that it become, we become what we call single-minded. So which is what exactly happens. We want to change how we are because people only respond to what appeals to their heart and not what appeals to their head, contrary to uh, popular belief. And the way that the media shapes our thinking is through the use of what we call bias. Uh, bias in its you know, um, form, in its most purest form, is to show inclination or prejudice or for or against someone or something. So we, as in this call right now, have a bias towards Christianity. If you can come now and start to criticize Christianity, whoever you are, our first inclination is to defend our faith, is to defend our Christianity, which means that we have a bias towards Christianity because it's been propagated into our hearts and minds over however long that it's been spoken to us. You can go right now to people that support Trump and you show them all the indiscretions of Trump that he has done over the time. I can tell you right now that you can try until you are red in the face, you will not change their minds about whether they're going to vote for him or not because they have a bias towards him. So the media's role, um, as far as the people in power are concerned, or the media's power, is that it is able to utilize um, its reach to you to inform your bias, to inform what it is that you then stand for, that it is that you then propagate by filling it into your mind, whether subconsciously or unconsciously. Because over the 10,000 images we see per day, those images inform our bias in, um, to, the, to a very large extent. And there are types of bias, uh, gentlemen, in terms of how the media utilizes different types of bias to be able to shape our nation. The first type of bias that the media uses is what we call, the phrase has been coined now as fake news, where essentially what they would do is they would use strategic false reporting, where stories or events and perspective are included or not included in your media platform. So in a way, fake news is cleverly done in the sense that they don't overtly report something that is false. What they do is they give you a truth but they do not give you another truth that will count uh, that truth. So basically, they will then say there were a lot of people protesting and burning buildings down in Johannesburg, fighting over service delivery. Um, they may then leave out 
the fact that those people were protesting after they had not had electricity for two weeks and that it had come out that the person who was in power they uh, misappropriated funds now after you've watched that story everything they told you is true yes they did destroy um uh, uh, public property they did protest and it was over service delivery but you're not told about the other things that tipped over the scales to drive society to get to that point so they don't do it by way of telling you a lie they just do it by way of omission which also speaks to another form of bias that i'm going to next here i will not this one but the next one another form of bias is bias by headline basically a headline is what we use as a, as the media to attract you to a particular story but we have to shape your attitude towards that story um, when you're coming to it, when you're coming to read it. So by the time you read the story, you already have an idea of what we want you to feel or think of that story by the way that we work the headline. So for instance, um, uh, when Roy Moore was uh, standing up for the Senate seat of Alabama, um, obviously the Democrats wanted to bring you know, all his scandals out into the fore in order for him to lose the vote. And when Trump endorsed him, the headline, as you can see here, says, I am with Perv, because there were uh, stories of, of sexual misconduct about him. And this newspaper basically says that they have concluded that Roy Moore is a pervert and Trump is endorsing him. The story is about the fact that Trump is endorsing a person who has got sexual misconduct charges against him. That's what the story is about. But the headline is saying, I am with the pervert, which means that by the time you read the story, you must believe that whatever allegations about this guy are true, so that it shapes the way that you think about Roy Moore. On the other side, the, another newspaper will have this um, on the side that says, I stand with Ro uh, 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 Judge Roy Moore, which essentially, because at the time they call him Judge Roy Moore because he is the chief uh, justice of Alabama or was. So it is basically um, a, a, a way for the media to already uh, influence how you're going to think. So this advert will be on the front page, for instance, to counter the headline. So basically they would buy the time in the media or the space in the media to be able to influence your thoughts as well. As you can see, there would be then a counter story here of Justice Raymo with children holding them, um, choosing children. What we, and this is a story to counter the uh, sexual misconduct stories about how he abuses women and children and things like that. This one shows with actually that is not true. So these are all people that are fighting for your attention and for your support in order for them to at ascend to political power. And then one media that will then be in the center would be the one that would say the party is divided over the sex claims. So this is would be neutral. So basically you will have what we call the left media and the right media, and you've got the middle or the center as would, is, is now called a uh, media, which uh, tries by all means to uh, report with as little bias as possible. Um, and then you've got the bias through placement. I've, I've just got now a collage of different types of, of newspapers here. I can tell you here now that the editor of these newspapers wanted to use what we call, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, a headline that says, a dog has bitten a man will not sell newspapers. But a headline that says, a man has bitten a dog. Now that is going to sell newspapers because it is unusual. And as you can see, there are stories here that's, you know, um, that speak about a, um, a bus story. But you can see all the stories that have gotten prominence in this uh, collage are stories about blood and gore. Because if it bleeds, it leads. You attach a different story in order to ascertain how you want um, the person that is reading the story to feel. So the people here want us to speak mainly about, uh, sorry, I'm not sure if this text is coming from the gentleman here. Okay. The, the, the story that you hear, they want you to come thinking about rape. They want you to come out thinking about um, uh, 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 people that are being hurt and, 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 and killed because that is what 
sells or they believe that if it, the more it bleeds, the more it sells the newspapers. There are positive stories here, but they're not going to put that ahead because they want to give you the impression about the state of violence in the country so that when uh, any message that is given to you to stop the violence, then you will now allow cops to uh, invade your phone. You will not allow, allow cops to, to have soldiers um, coming into your cities and all that stuff because you have been told that there's a lot of rape and there's a lot of beating because they give you stats um, or they, they, they give prominence to stories that will instill the, the, the spirit of fear in you. Now, another type of bias, as you can see here, uh, poor uh, Prince, Win, uh, Prince William is a bias by way of camera angles. They is now, uh, you know, pulling a zap sign on the people there. You know, he's the prince, he's got the money, he's got the power. This is him swearing at his subjects. This is him telling his people what he thinks of them as he enters into the car. This is a story in the newspaper that you would see. This is a picture that would be on that street pole that will say, this is your Prince William, Britain. Um, when in actual fact, the truth of the matter is that this is just an angle they showed you. What was actually happening is that this is not a zap sign. It's just him uh, doing a line of three. But depending on which picture you are looking at, you will perceive this gentleman to be a particular person. So, it is, so they will use a particular angle or a particular picture to be able to shape how you think of a person. If you did not see this picture and all this you see, you now have a perception about this guy. The next time you hear him say anything at all, it does not matter how good it is, this has now shaped what you think of him. So the power um, of camera angles, the power of what they show you, that gives, um, in, increases your perception of what you see. And then it's a bias through the, uh, the use of names and titles. Um, this is an old one, of course, um, uh, which, which, which uh, people have said that it, is, it, it was uh, some kind of Photoshop on it, where essentially they want to show the, uh, what they call the, the, the dictatorship or the dictatorness or dictator levels of in, within the, the EFF, where they say that it is not a party of equals, but it is one, it's got one owner um, by way of a dictator called Rias Malema. But they don't say that. They just show you a designation of sorts. You know, um, this media platform has since come out to say this was actually a, a, a Photoshop. But what it does illustrate is that the way that a person is, 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 is uh, chironed or rather strapped um, in, a, in a news platform essentially shapes what you think of them. Because we now see him as an owner, we now see him as, as a dictator, uh, because of the way that they've used, you know, those platforms, the platforms to to brand him or to title him. So this is all very subtle, uh, to shape our thinking as a society. And then there's also the bias through statistics and and, and crowd control, incomplete, inaccurate, or selective use of statistics. You know, um, these are two uh, pictures of the same event. The event on the left was the picture was taken to essentially show an angle that shows that there were very few people at um, this inauguration of Donald Trump. While on the other side, the angle was taken from a side where all the empty spaces were covered to show a very, very full um, area for the inauguration of, of the president uh, of America currently now. So the Democrats would push the picture on the left and the Republicans would push the picture on the right all to try and say to you, this man has no support, while the other ones are saying this man has support. So you, as the a person who's consuming the media, begin to shape your thinking about the President Donald Trump's support based on who it is that is telling you the story. So there's always, like we say in the media, the third side of the story. And of course, the tone that is used mm -hmm. In, in the headlines, uh, in the stories that we've given you, already shape how you think of the person. Britain media or British media did not like, you know, Meghan. And there was a thought and there was talks about how Meghan, when he married, she married Prince Harry, you know, was not liked because the, the, of the undertones of racism within um, the British state. And as you can see how they say, Meghan flees to Canada, when flee means you are running away from something. 
which means the headline already assumes or rather tells you that she's running away. She could have left for any reason, but they are making an assumption as a media platform that she's fleeing. When you flee, it means you are running away. So they're utilizing the tone of, um, of, of, of negative words to be able to shape your thinking about that particular person. So um, Meg's um, uh, of, you know, that's, that's basically crisis talks, coupled defied the queen. And they are saying here, if you can see defied, you can see Prince Harry's name is in very small letters, but Meghan's name is in big letters right below the fact that they defied the queen, which means they are attributing the defying of the queen mainly to her, assuming or rather purporting that before uh, she joined, Harry was a good prince that listened to his old mother. But as soon as she got here, she a queen is defied. So basically to say she is coming here to defile our monarchy as the British. So they have now formed a perception about her to the extent that the couple even left uh, Britain just so that they can be able to leave the toxic environment. So also, the media can basically say anything without getting into trouble by uh, source, um, sourcing or rather citing what they call a secret source. The law allows the media to tell you something as a fact without having to tell you where they got it from. They are allowed to say that I, I have the right to not reveal my sources, which means I can come right now to Farai and Farai can give me a false story about a particular person and say, this is what the person did. I can then go and write a whole article about that and say that this person um, stole money from somewhere uh, according to the secret source that we got who is close to the person in question. And that is it. And it does not have to be proven for the seed to be planted. Just it being in the new media, that, that, pla that platform is now protected by law because they don't have to reveal their source. Um, and because they don't have to reveal their source, they can pretty much report anything. So you are at the mercy right now of a, 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 a media reporting anything about you, as long as they give you what they call a right of reply, which means they can come to you to say, um, they are saying you stole money. What is your response to that? Um, and your response can be one line or reduced to one line. They can write an entire half article quoting them, and then they'll come and say to you, when contacted for, for comment, the, the person in question said, it is not true. And that is all that they will give you. The, the onus and the discretion is upon them about how much you get quoted. So the media controls narrative in that, in that manner. But now, how can anyone then, seeing that the media has got that much power, how can anyone be part of the fourth estate? How is it that you, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual, can form part of, of the, um, um, the fourth estate? If I can just speak about my journey particularly, in terms of how I form part of it uh, um, as an individual, is that I've been in the professional media space now for uh, 20 years. I've been uh, uh, um, running a, a company for seven, uh, well, it's 19 years now, actually. I think when I gave you that, it, it hadn't been updated from two years ago. But um, I've been in around ar for 20 years in the media space. I've been mainly focused on religious, educational, and current affairs um, uh, uh, type of media. Uh, I'm a specialist, particularly in factual content, although we also produce fiction, drama series, and things like that. Uh, in films, uh, but but mainly uh, we are focused on factual content and current affairs. Uh, we double in entertainment type of content, but our main focus is is mainly on factual because we've seen the power of factual content on different platforms and mainly in uh, electronic media. Now, this is the type of uh, these are, are some of the titles that I've created and have worked on, um, you know, in the media space, particularly on on broadcast television. Um, we, 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 we did a show called I Want to Sing Gospel, which was a talent search show for, you know, um, gospel musicians. Uh, we do a show called It's Gospel Time for SABC2, currently now hosted by Rebecca Malupe. Um, we do a show called Verified, which is a game show on SABC1. We do a talk show called Trending SA on SABC3, where we basically take trending topics that people are talking about on that day and basically delve into them to give context as to how it got to trend, why it's trending, uh, what happened and how it started to trend, to begin to start conversations 
uh, with the viewer, and it's very interactive in that way. We do a show called Rhythm and Gospel on BET, um, uh, hosted by Yukai Mtetwa, and uh, we do a, a health and wellness show called DJ Libo Pilo um, on SABC as well, and we do a talk show on ethics and values, where we take somebody who's got a moral dilemma and we bring them before experts to give them advice on what decision to take um, uh, and the pros and cons of those decisions. Uh, we do a show called uh, Big Up, which is basically um, a, um, a Jamaican phrase that means, you know, uh, kudos to you, salute to you, where we look at people in communities that are doing great work to uplift their communities. And we do a 30-minute documentary series on them for the whole of... Um, the country to see what they're doing in their community so that we can inspire other people to do the same. So the concept here is that a popular musician will then come with us to come and see the work that you do to inspire a song that they can then create and do a music video to salute you. And every week in this show, we do a new music video by a popular artist, which then becomes popular in, in the mainstream. So you guys could have heard these songs playing on the radio when and the music videos on TV when they were actually influenced. Uh, by this artist ha having gone uh, with Big Up to go and, um, you know, salute a, a, a community builders in their community, focusing mainly on young people to inspire uh, the spirit of volunteerism in the country. Um, we also have a, a show on SABC2 that plays on Sundays that call, it's called RSVP Dare to Change, where we basically pit two people together who have completely different points of view about a particular subject matter. If we can take black economic empowerment, for instance, if this uh, a day to change episode would be one where a white person would feel done under by this law to say that I can't get work as a white person and I feel it's reverse racism. And then we pit them against somebody who is um, a, an expert in the area of, of, of black economic empowerment to show this white person why it is important to have it by taking this white person onto a journey um, of seeing how black people actually live in this country and why white people still have the privilege and how he should change his point of view to be able to see it from the side of, of the black person, that they can understand why it's important to still have um, a BEE uh, in the country. And that has become very successful. So this is the ways that we are creating on television to try and counter a narrative um, you know, and, and begin to shape a narrative that builds a society instead of breaking it down. And of course, our latest, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, venture is Newsroom Africa, which started about a year ago. We launched on the 2nd of May um, and in 2019 on air. And it works now as a 24-hour, uh, seven days a week news channel on DSTV 405 complete a, a news channel that reports. Now, like we said, that there is the left media, there is the right media, and there's a center media. We've decided to place ourselves in the center where we don't, or push to rather, try and not propagate uh, towards a particular idea, but really center ourselves on, 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 on the constitution of the country. So basically, this is, 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 is where we are right now. Um, uh, in terms of the things that we cover, um, in terms of the way that we come. This is the type of talent that we've got. As we know, Tami Gubeni, who hosts the Christian uh, show on um, Metro FM on Sunday mornings, has also joined us. She's with us every single day from 12 to 3. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got Stephen Scrotes there. We've got uh, Kathy Mushashana. We've got OJG Dabane, who's just been joined by Colin Gandhi on Channel 405. Um, so basically, like we said, everybody has got a bias. And, and we don't prefer to not have a bias. We do have a bias. And our bias and our agenda is toward upholding the principles of ASA's constitution. So whatever the constitution stands for, we stand for. So if you break the values of the, of the constitution, we'll go after you. Uh, there's a big story now about you know, uh, Edwin Sodi and how the people in, in the free state are living you know, with asbestos roofs and they've squandered their money for it. We are focusing on that story. But there's also a story of people that are doing good work somewhere else, and we're focusing on that story as well. So we are not partisan in any way. Uh, what we try to do as much as possible is uh, the constitution of our, 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 our editorial policy is to always uphold the principles and the values of South Africa's constitution. We seek to edutain and empower people with our media work. 
um, and we stand for equality and fairness in society. We embrace activism and advocacy around the human rights. Uh, right now, the campaign that we are running has been hope with every step with Pastor um, Kabela Mabalane, uh, where he undertook to run you know, 600 kilometers to raise money for uh, underprivileged children. We as a channel decided to partner with that and take it up as our um, a process where we were driving and, 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 and um, uh, exposing you know, the plight of young children as Gabelo, uh, Pastor Gabelo rather was running with um, Peteni Kuzwayo across from Johannesburg to Durban. You know, he would stop at all these places where they are be under, under, under privileged children. We followed him with our cameras to be able to show his journey. And we were able to show the real conditions that people are living under in, on, en route from uh, Joey to Cape Town. And the process was for, you know, to raise the awareness of society to be able to be more um, helpful towards people who are underprivileged. We have now also um, done a, a campaign where we are speaking about gender equality, even in, you know, things like our coat of arms, the representation of women there. So we are definitely, definitely, um, you know, standing for activism and uh, advocacy in, in, and uh, towards the betterment of society. And uh, we want people that have got, you know, uh, the same belief system in us about upholding. And, um, you know, me, of course, as, as, as the founder, or rather the co-founder, the two of us who founded it, you know, based, basing my reasons to founding it on Christian principles. So we'd like to, as much as possible, um, stick to that and being fair to every other religion at the same time. So there are types of media, um, you know, uh, uh, gentlemen, and the types of media that there are, you know, you've got newspapers, you've got magazines, you've got radio, you've got television, but the most powerful right now, which is where everyone can be part of the fourth estate is the advent of the internet. With the advent of the internet, you know, the world has changed, literally. 90%, gentlemen, 90% of all data in the world was created in the last two years. Meaning that in the last, since, since the inception, since creation, 90%, this is according to the IBM research, 90%, almost all the data that was collated in the world was collated in the last two years. That is how much power the uh, internet has. If I can just give you a little bit here on, on, on what the total population is in South Africa. This is, um, you know, Hoot Suite's uh, some, um, uh, research and survey from last year that there were 57 million people at the time and 98 uh, mobile subscriptions were there, which means that one person has got more than one phone. Basically, we have got 1.7 phones, that most people have got more than one phone. Um, and then the, out of those people, out of those 50, 31 million of us are on the internet, which means 54% uh, of society in South Africa currently is on the internet. And people who are active um, on the internet, particularly on social media, is 23 million people. And uh, those that access their social media on their mobile phones is 22 million of them, which means um, uh, on 23, only a million people don't access it over their phones. Now, the time spent in the media, this is, how my, this is how the media gets to influence our thinking. The time that we spend on the media, um, we spend an average time, daily time spent on the internet is eight hours per day, which means that the average person is on the internet or connected to the internet in, uh, an average time of eight minutes per day. Uh, the average daily time that we spend using social media on any device is two hours per day. So if you are, are sleeping for eight hours on a 24-hour day, uh, um, and then the, the remaining time there would be around, you know, 16 hours, two of those 16 hours you'll spend on a, a social media on average. Some people spend even more time on that. Um, you know, music and things that we're listening to, podcasts and things like that, would, you know, take around a, an hour or so of our day. Now, mainstream media has seen the power of the internet, and you know these are just examples of different platforms that have leveraged, you know, social media and are now reporting on those platforms, and they are growing quite extra extraordinarily on on those platforms. Um, and but the power, gentlemen, where the power you know uh, lies is on social media. 
which is what we call citizen journalism. This is where the ordinary person can also be part of the fourth estate, can also influence the thinking of society by what we call citizen journalism, which is what we at Newsroom Africa have embraced, um, where we give credit to citizens whenever stories are brought to us, where we encourage them to utilize, because this phone is in actual fact a camera. We leave with a, a reporter and a cameraman to go and shoot the story. But you, with your phone, you are the journalist. You already have that phone. You are already connected to everybody. 33 million people in South Africa already. Just by you posting your story directly, without a media platform at all, you are already able to reach uh, the 33 million people who are on the internet, um, the 23 million people who are on social media in, 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 in um in any given day and the more you post the more the algorithm of the social media platform serves you to more people so the th truth is you are the fourth estate gentlemen that we may have the platforms as the mainstream media but the truth of the matter is you are part of the fourth estate if you have a phone if you have internet and you have got a story to tell so the question is what is your story you know what is your point of view you know, the key is to make sure that you make yourself heard. What is your truth? The truth, the good thing is to always make sure that you build credibility on these platforms by, you know, um, making fact-checked uh, utterances. You lose credibility, of course, if you just retweet or repost, you know, fake news. So it's important for you to make sure that whenever, whatever you post, you give an idea. So when, and the, and the trick here is that whenever you repost something, always add your thoughts onto it so if you're going to retweet rather quote tweet instead of just retweeting because then the algorithm of twitter sees you as having an opinion and for twitter to be uh, popular you need to have an opinion they want people's opinions to be shared so if you are just passing on an opinion uh, you don't be, you don't rise up the ranks in terms of you being served to other people or your 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 algorithm changing in terms of your your you being fed into other people's uh, news news lines or timelines uh, so you need to become a good news source therefore and not just a news source in terms of what's happening just report about what's happening around you and your thoughts about what's happening around you and those opinion pieces whether it's by a podcast or just a normal post on any platform um uh, begins to you now have essentially then joined the ranks of the media as well as an influencer, so to speak. Give your testimony on there because it may touch someone. You know, do not be encouraged by the fact that there's very little or no engagement on your posts. The more you post, the more, like I said, the more social media algorithms will begin to serve you to more people because they want conversation. The success of these social media platforms is on conversation. So the more you enter the conversation, the more you comment on other people's platforms, the more you are active, the more they like you and the more they, they grow you as a platform as well because they want to create influences. So the key, gentlemen, out of the talk that I gave now is to say, have your say. Everybody has got a message to tell. We are all a royal priesthood. You know, we all um, have a message to share. And uh, with that, I need to thank you. Uh, I, did, I went longer than I thought I would. And um, yeah, and uh, we're opening it up to you know, a conversation going forward. And I'm hoping that uh, there's something um, that we got out of this. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nkosi. This was a very powerful message. Um, it's a practical example and demonstration of, of when we speak of the seven uh, mountains of influence, uh, just how powerful the media is um, in painting the, the, the narrative of the day and also influencing our, our outlook on, on life as a whole. Um, so we do have a few comments at this point in time. I'd like to hand over to Brother Felix, who will assist us with the moderation of any comments. We just, we just encourage you as men, uh, if you just um, post any comments or anything that's pertinent on your heart, then Mr. Ngozi will be able to answer it. Thank you so much, Mr. Ngozi. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful presentation. It's always nice when you hear from the, from the master. It's always good when you hear from the experts. Um, uh, it's, it, it gives a lot of uh, credibility and there's a lot of substance for, that I've also learned uh, from, your, from your presentation. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of comments coming through here. Um, Kuti Papaya says, wow, great work. Thanks, my brother. And uh, Mauti Posen says, quite insightful. 
great work as well. So there's a lot of um, appreciation of the great work that we are doing. And then on the questions, I'm going to combine the first two questions because they are both political questions. And then the first one says, do we have media that is bi that are biased towards, say, ANC and discredit other political parties? And the second one, which is in the same vein, is from um, uh, Brother uh, Blessing Tambara says, following up on Mr. Sebola's question above, is the media reporting fairly on former president, Mr. Jacob Zuma? Over to you. Okay. Okay, thank you for those questions, uh, gentlemen. Um, you know, uh, I, I always say that the media platforms are not homogenous, um, which essentially means that even in their one newsroom, not every person thinks the same. So the only thing that you can do really as, as, a, as a, okay, maybe I need to just give context from my side. We, we've got what we call the Chinese wall in, 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 in our company, and it's what we, we wanted to embrace, where those that have got the commercial imperatives of the business, because my job is to make sure that the lights are on and that, the, you know, and, and, and that we keep going. Uh, so I have to get the, go out and get advertisers, and I have to get, make sure that the, we, we keep our heads above water. And as a result, I have removed myself deliberately from making editorial decisions because my imperatives are to keep us afloat, which means if Samsung, who advertises on our platform, says, hey, man, please don't report that negative story on us uh, because, uh, you know, it's not good for our brand. And, you know, if our brand gets tainted, it means that we won't have money to advertise on your platform. You know, so, so and I can't now be able to go to the newsroom and say, hey, guys, please pull that story. So what we've done is to, to give the, the independence of the newsroom is to let the, our news director be the one uh, that has the final say. We've then now formulated what we call a, 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 um, a, a editorial ethics committee where any complaints that comes from the public goes to that committee. And it's a committee of noble people. Um, the former press ombudsman, uh, Dr. Joe Trollway, is, is, is the chair of that. And we've got people in academia in the, um, from, from journalism schools who have no affiliation or financial gain from our platform and are really standing there as societal safeguards that we report fairly. And whenever stories or complaints are brought to them, they, they make the judgment on that. And whatever judgment they make stands, which means if somebody gets suspended or, or um, dismissed because of that, then it happens. They basically are our judiciary within the company. Uh, having said that, the media platform now in South Africa is trying by all means to come across as being not as biased as, 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 you know, as, as possible. Because what happens when you are biased is that it becomes obvious that you are biased and then people just leave. And we are fighting for audiences. To a very large extent, we are fighting for audiences. And for you to retain audiences, you need to report in a manner that is credible. So it's difficult to say whether there are media houses that are reporting in favor of the ANC or not. Media houses are basically generally reporting in a manner that will get them the most circulation if they're a newspaper, or will get them the most viewers if they're a TV, or they get them the most listeners if they're radio. So they're basically reporting in a manner that uh, some would call um, um, populist, so to speak. But what we're trying to do, which is why we launched our station, was to try and say, look, there is a way to not be populist and still keep your head above water. So yes, depending on who, on, on who the editor is of that newspaper at the time, you might find that there'll be a bias towards or against the ANC, depending on what it is that will sell that story at that particular time. Jacob Zuma is a good news story. So because... So generally, as a commercial venture, media houses report on what they believe, uh, as is the short answer, will give them the most traction uh, with, with audiences. But depending on who's writing that story, yes, that bias will show. But no, no media house is homogenous, where everybody's like a sheep, and they're following a, a particular uh, school of thought. Yeah, so that's basically the, 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 the gist of it. 
Thanks so much. Um, I think there's been a, a, a lot of insight in that, uh, in that, in that response. And you are right. Uh, I think the former president is a, is a great story, to, which sells a lot and creates good emotion and uh, good yeah. engagement. Um, Indeed. <laughs> I want to pick up two questions that are related to Christianity here. One um, is from Multipotence. It says, what are some of the ways used by the media to discredit Christianity? And how do we counter, especially the negative media influence on the young generation against um, Christianity? I want to balance to, to, to basically combine it with another one from Kutu Papaya, which says, from a Christian perspective, how would we know the real agenda of the media? Over to you. Okay. Um, the, the, the first question, let me see if I'm on here. The first question mainly, uh, you know, the way that I, I don't think that the media goes out there to try and discredit Christianity. Like I said, what the media goes out there to do is to look at what it is that people are interested in. And they will report on that. Like I said, um, a dog bites a man is not a story, but a man bites a dog. Now that's a story. Um, and And so they will go and look at a story and if the discrediting of a particular religion is a good story then that's what they will do because at the end of the day it's 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 not like they are um you know part of a political uh, formation that they, it's really a business at the end of the day um so they will go and do you know a pastors that have got you know, stories hanging off their heads. Because it's a public thing, I'll mention names. I mean, you'll know that Omotoso is always, Omotoso is always on, on the media. You will know that uh, Bushiri is always in the media. And they're not really uh, highlighting these people or putting a spotlight on these people because they're trying to say, you see, Christianity is bad and that's what we're doing. They're doing it because those are stories are selling like crazy because those are very popular stories. Um, and, and those will bring, because at the end of the day, when you go to the board to present your numbers, they're not going to ask you, what do you believe? How much of Christianity have, have you discredited? They are going to say, how many, what are the numbers? What are your revenues uh, numbers for you to keep your job, for you to get your bonus? So if it takes the discrediting of the Christianity in order for them to be able to sell a good story, then that is exactly what they will do. If it were, they were going to praise Christianity because that's going to sell a good story, that is exactly what they would. So at, it, it, it all boils down to commercials at the end of the day. The economics of it really determine it. In a platform where you've got almost like a dictator type of government, where it's inverted commas democratic, but really it isn't, um, you know, and we know that, you know, there are some African countries and some even some European countries that are like that, um, where the media is really, really not free, where for your survival commercially, you need to report in a particular way. So even there, your reporting that's favorable to the government is not because you like the government, it's because that is where your funding comes from. So at the end of the day, the media is not this very noble you know, we are here for a cause. It's a business. It's like selling burgers. Um, you know, they will tell you a story that you need to hear in order to be able to um, uh, make the bucks, really, and to get the eyeballs away from their competitors. Uh, please remind me of the other question, sir. Um, with the, 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 the other question, you probably have touched on it. It says, so from a Christian perspective, how do we know the real agenda of the media? The, the real, yeah, like I said, it's not, it's not really, um, uh, what do you call this? They're not really homogenous, which means they're not really, there's no group thing. So different media uh, houses have got different, you know, uh, way, ways of doing things. But remember, there's also, there's also what we call a, um, a narrative. So what will happen is that if there's a particular narrative that we believe, so if we believe that Mandela is good, Right, Mandela is a good person. Mandela um, liberated the country, and that is what will help the country at the time to heal. Then you'll find that a lot of reporting will go along those lines because that is what people want to hear. If you're going to hear that, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, 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 of another South African example about, you know, uh, Jacob Zuma, for instance. Um, the narrative that Jacob Zuma is 
good will not sell your newspaper for you because the 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 narrative that is formed is done so subtly over such a long period of time that for you to survive in the space, you almost have to report in a manner that is in line with the current narrative. And remember, you as the reporter don't really have, you, you can't have a say. You can't really come in and give what you call your opinion. You have to seem objective. So what you would do is you would then, if you want to show Zuma as good, you let to go to pro Zuma people and speak to them only. But the problem is that every other media platform is discrediting each of them. So you look like a platform of buffoons coming onto your platform to and uh, to you know uh, spew bile and speak non non nonsensicals. Um, so your credibility then goes down. So you then now forced to give the view as well that is against Zuma in order for you to seem and to come across as being equal. And because there's already a pre-perceived idea about who Zuma is, um, however you report on him will not change the way that people think. So the key now is to, the best of your knowledge as a media platform is to present truth as much as possible and, um, uh, and know what the risks are of doing that. Okay, great. Thank, thanks so much. Um, I just want to read about three comments and then take the next question. Mount sure. says, wow, wow. Great presentation and great content. And Thank you. Um, Johannes Winter says, very informative in the power of the media and how our, our psych is shaped. And Reverend Rabador says, Thank you, Mr. Ngos, for an eye opener opening uh, presentation. And I'll then take question from Dr. Uh, Simugai Sham. Dr. Sham mm -hmm. says, Thank you, Mr. Ngos. Do you have some challenges to share? in regards to dominating F through the media platforms while balancing with your Christian perspective or love? Yes. Oh, the challenge is um, because I, I, have, <laughs> I have a bias towards Christianity, right? Um, because I'm a Christian myself. And it pains me, you know, to have to report negatively on, you know, what other brethren or, are, are doing in the, in the gospel. Um, you know, I, I sit and I watch even on our own platform when we have to report on the bad things that our, our leaders in the church are doing. Um, and and because, you know, we have to be a fair platform, we have to do it. So my own beliefs then, you know, become a, um, a non-issue, really, when you have to report. Uh, so, I mean, my... <laughs> My, my, my staff always jokes that if, if, if I were to do anything wrong myself, I would see myself on that platform as well. So that's how independent we try to, to, to have them. But the challenges are mainly on, on the area of, of, you know, my own views and my own beliefs, um, you know, being, being, not being able to play a role in the way that we we, we report what we've tried to do is in the people that we've placed we we you know although we don't make it a a, a a prerequisite but it's always beneficial if you know we share the same faith you know and we talk and, and things like that so that when you do the work you are also influenced by the greater good um you are also influenced by the the, the great commission but really the, the the main the main the main issue is about me as a christian and how do I utilize these platforms to advance the Great Commission um, in, a, in an environment where you are in a secular state, uh, where you cannot openly propagate uh, a particular religious worldview? Um, and uh, so in all the work that we do, some are overtly Christian, like the, the titles that we showed you, some are not, but we always utilize Christian principles to inform them. Because what we realized at the end of the day, that even if you don't mention the Bible. If you utilize biblical principles, you still get the result. Great, very, very sound, sound advice indeed. Um, yeah. I want to take two questions from Dumisami Desmond Due and Kutsi Papaya. They're, they're, they're linked. Um, Dumisa is thank you for the great presentation and taking a lead in driving the Christian and constitutional agenda via media. Do you yeah. think that the Christian community is currently making enough effort? to influence 
the media agenda. If not, where are we lacking the most? And Kudzi almost says the similar thing. He says, especially in South Africa in media for Christianity, liberalism, sorry, especially in South Africa, is the media for Christianity, liberalism, or conservatism. In the USA, what's your take on Rush, Liberty, Fox News? Are we promoting Jesus as Christians? Okay. <laughs> Rush is quite an interesting character. <laughs> uh, but, but you see, Rush is an example of what I was talking about earlier, that it doesn't matter what you say about Trump. You're not going to change his mind. Uh, but those guys have become very polarized. But, uh, you know, okay, in South Africa now, our democracy is still very young. In America, their democracy is very, very mature. We still have, you know, a hundred political parties that contest and can even get seats you know there's a new muslim party that was formed now that got a seat in parliament um so we we are we're still a multi-party system so we're still very young democracy but because we are heading towards coalition government which is what the course any uh, democratic state takes is that these small parties will eventually have to combine and form coalitions and become one party and over time you'll start having two major parties in one little tiny party, right? So you'll end up with, I'm not sure what the formation of those parties are going to be, but you'll end up with some kind of an ANC coalition and some kind of a DA coalition, right? ANC, which is essentially center-left, um, and DA, which is center-right. And then you'll have these splinters, like your your the, your radical right, FF, and your radical left, which is the the the, the EFF. Uh, the FF is Freedom Front, and the EFF is is the is um, thingy, the the um, the more leftist ones, the, the you know the guys that are communist. Um, so in in a sense, you 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 are going to find that the big two big parties. What people don't realize is that America also has a lot of parties, but they don't matter. You're not going to see them on television because they are so small. Uh, the ones that are major are the two ones, and like those media platforms, like. Um, uh, Rupert Murdoch and all that who owns Fox News, he's not he, he he's making money. He's capitalizing on the polarizedness of of the states, you know. Um, and the MSNBC, they're also um, uh, well, NBC Universal really, which owns MSNBC, is also capitalizing on the polarized nature of it. So they speak to a particular base, and they purport a particular view. And only if you want to hear that view, you go to them. Now, in South Africa, it's a bit different. You know, you've got people that want to hear the EFF view. You want people that want to hear the, the Freedom Front view. You have people that want to hear the ANC view, the DA view, the, the, the um, Holomisa, you know, UDM view. So we're still in a very young society. So we still have the opportunity, you know, as Christians to also um, influence because when when the young, the democracy of America was young, there was no social media. You did not have access to everyone. Now, everybody on this call has got access to 33 million people. So in terms of the question of how do, what role do we play, we need to counter mainstream media as individuals and be able to create our own little media platforms. And we ourselves become our own little media platforms. And if we can, you know, form and, and organize and mobilize and begin to say, look, if one person posts a particular thing, all of us must retweet it, must repost it and make a comment on it. We must make it trend. And when it trends, it forces Trending SA to talk about it because the Trending SA show that plays every day is forced to speak about all the trending topics. Now you have now taken your agenda into the mainstream by forcing it in because you have used the power of numbers to take it into the mainstream. Our channel as well, um, throughout the day, uh, we do what we call social listening. Social listening is when we are always on social media to look at what subjects are being spoken about in order to shape out what we call our news diary. Because at any given time, news happens, right? There are 100 stories that are breaking. Um, you have to decide which ones will get you the most viewers. So for us to do that, you need to be able to do what you call social listening and see which ones of those stories is gaining traction on social media, because that is where the 33 million people are. And you then focus your attention on those ones that are taking, um, that are, are gaining traction on there. 
um, and then you speak about those. So we, as individuals, can then force media to speak about our subject matter or to begin to shape what they say, or what they talk about by flooding, you know, the, the social space with our propagated messages. And you will begin to see that that is how you begin to infiltrate what we call the, the social media. So how do we, as uh, the Christian body, um, uh, uh, play a role in shaping media and shaping society? We force ourselves into the media space because the media space wants people. And if there are, if 80% of society in South Africa is Christian, trust me, if we're saying that Christian people are going to watch you because of your type of content, and this is what Christian people want to see spoken about, our social listening efforts will show that, and you'll start to see more of your content on air. So you can shape what gets covered. Great. Um, thanks so much. Um, I want to take two more questions, that, but these ones are... Uh, kind of like bias towards the economics and the, the finances sure. of, of, of the business. So so firstly, Johannes Winter says, how do you balance it with the Chinese war you cited in the Sorry, industry? you're breaking there? Okay, uh, let me, yes, I can see my, my, my network is giving me a bit of problems. Can you hear me now? Okay, can you just give me two minutes? I just want to also plug my computer in, my battery is dying. Happiness, go, go for it. Thanks. I will just read one or two comments as um as Gossi is Mr. Gossi is just uh, locking and pulling his laptop there. Uh Kudzi was thanking him. Thank you for the